Welcome, everyone. Welcome. This is the 97th online gathering of courageous leaders across the country. 97. Can you believe it? This uh, monthly gathering is called Courageous Leadership, and it's sponsored by the ELCA Coaching Ministry. I am Tammy Devine. I'm a deacon, and my pronouns are she, her. I'm currently serving as the ELCA Coordinator for Generosity Coaching Ministries, and I'm going to be one of your facilitators today. I'm filling in for our ELCA Coaching Ministry Program Director, Jill Beverlin, and we can hold her in prayer as she has had the opportunity to have some time away, much needed rest, as we all need to take time for rest and Sabbath. And I welcome also Pastor David Hyverly, who is here to support us in the role that is usually filled by Jason O'Neill. So thank you for your uh, collegiality and support today, David. This gathering provides us a safe and brave space for each of us to be reminded that we bring the truth of who we are and how we're doing. These conversations are meant to be an intentional step to live more fully into God's dream for us as the body of Christ. As we begin our time today, I'm going to invite you just to be, to quiet yourself, as a way of a bridge from your busy day into this space. So I invite you to breathe in God's goodness and exhale all that's getting in the way of being present in our time together. I invite you to sit comfortably with your feet on the floor, with your hands open, Quieting your mind. Noticing where you might be holding on to any tension or anxiety in your body. Relaxing and breathing into that space. And be. I'd like to share with you the words from poet Morgan Harper Nichols. Amidst all the pressure to keep doing and keep going, may you also take time to learn the art of being. Being loved. Being held. Being seen, being in the presence of the one who calls you to rest. For beyond your accomplishments and your calendars and your lists, you were made with purpose and intention to reflect glorious light and to abide in love that reminds you even in the pause, you are still where you need to be. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Creator God, you made us all in your image. Help us to embrace one another as you do, beloved and blessed. Not in need of fixing, but in need of authentic welcome. Bring healing where it is desired. Affirmations where it is lacking. And awareness to all. Open our hearts to receive the gifts and needs of all people and to become communities where everyone can find a place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Well, today we welcome our guest speaker, author and poet Daniel Bowman, Jr. Daniel's an associate professor of English at Taylor University in Upland, Indiana, where he co-directs the Making Literature Conference. He writes and speaks regularly on neurodiversity and mental health, and he mentors young people on the spectrum. Daniel will be sharing with us key points from his memoir, On the Spectrum, Autism, Faith, and the Gifts of Neurodiversity. Welcome, Daniel, to our space. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, I was going to start with a reading, um, and so just to kind of set this up for a minute, um, the book the book is not um, it's not a book of it's not a work of theology. It's not a theo it's not a book about um, disability per se. Uh, it's a memoir, so it's just it's my own story. It's storytelling. And so I'm going to begin at the beginning of the book with uh, the crisis that led me to seek out an autism diagnosis when I was about 35. So we're going on almost 10 years ago now at this point. And uh, many times, as, as I'm sure you're all aware, um, it's moments of crises that lead us to seek greater wisdom and understanding through prayer. And, um, and, that's, and that's kind of how this all happened for me. So I'll begin with a, a short reading. I'm going to read two little pieces of the beginning. <clears throat> uh, this is from the, the prelude of the book, and uh, it has um, two epigraphs from, from other writers. I'm just going to read the shorter one uh, by a writer named Virginia Stem Owens, who's a wonderful writer. Uh, and she says, as we shape our stories, we shape ourselves. Mm. October 2019. The last suitcase has been packed into the car. The odometer on our 2006 Honda shows nearly 300,000 miles, but we trust it as much as ever. It took us safely to Sarasota, Atlanta, Charleston, Baltimore, New York, and back home again just a few months ago. This trip, Beth and the kids are visiting our friends who moved to North Carolina after eight years here in Indiana, eight years of developing the most cherished relationship we've ever known as a family. I ache to see our friends too, but my fall break at the university does not come for a few more weeks, so I must stay home. I'm sitting in our dining room table in my usual seat. The house looks different when I'm about to be alone. Details suddenly jump out at me. The original oak framework on the pocket doors, the 1950s rose vine wallpaper, the 1930s Wurlitzer piano our daughter Una plays every day. I like telling guests, especially my English majors, that the house was built in 1890, the same summer that Oscar Wilde's The Picture of Dorian Gray was published. The romance of this knowledge is lost in life's dailiness running Una to play rehearsals in jazz band, or Casey to robotics club, Beth baking bread or writing poems, migrating another freshman essay. But just now the house and its history feel important to me. They crystallize in the shadow of the coming loneliness. I tried to thwart the melancholy with an ambitious mental list of things I could do this week. Certainly I'll catch up on schoolwork. I can probably finish the new ta Coates book. I need to call my mom and it wouldn't hurt to jog a few miles. In reality, I'll clean the house obsessively to exert maximum control over my environment. And I'll somehow fall further behind on schoolwork because I always seem to. I'll put off phone calls and texts as they'll feel unbearable. An indiscriminate number of episodes of TV shows Beth doesn't care for, spy thrillers and sci-fi, will form the backdrop of my evenings. I'll stay up too late staring into screens with near absolute lack of purpose, counting down the hours until I'm no longer alone. Every day of the week, I'll remind myself over and over that this leaving is okay, 
This one is good and right and temporary, and I don't need to be scared. Yet my body won't respond to reason. It has a memory of its own. This is not like that other leaving, I tell myself, the memory of which makes the back of my neck go cold. As if reading my mind, Beth puts her hand on my shoulder. She's cautious, but I also detect a playful warmth. Love you, she says. It sends me. It always has. It doesn't come all the time. At times it has stopped coming altogether. Sometimes in its place, it's ugly opposite. Those memories give me pause. I've deserved it if anyone has. I've caused pain. What's more, I've caused trauma. I never meant to, but as the Mills brothers saying in 1944, you always hurt the one you love. And there's this dark, knotted truth in that. There's a particularly autistic way this hurting can happen, inadvertently mostly, by virtue of the fact that what autistics need so deeply, just to function from moment to moment, seems often to run counter to what people need from us. Maybe we need structure and predictability at the very time the people in our lives need whim or impulse. Maybe we need to be alone when they long for companionship. Maybe our senses are overloaded when theirs are underwhelmed. It can seem like we're acting unkindly or worse, though almost always we're just trying to survive in a world that was not made for us. Of course, before you have a diagnosis, you don't know any of this. You can't know. The story you tell yourself about yourself, the story that shapes you, is that you're not normal, that you're an awful human being, a lousy friend, a bad husband, even a bad parent. You think you're letting everyone down, and that maybe the people in your life would be better off without you. For those of us who follow Jesus, we believe we're doing that badly too, that pursuit that informs all the others. We're laying waste to a witness in the world. We ask God, where are you? We live with shame and guilt. One study of autistic res adults released by Anglia Ruskin University in Cambridge confirms, quote, Dr. Stephen Stagg, senior lecturer in psychology said, one aspect of our research I found heart-wrenching was that autistic participants had grown up believing they were bad people. They referred to themselves as, quote, alien and non-human. The same study also says that many of us are treated for depression. Other studies show that the suicide rate for autistic people is 10 times higher than that of our holistic peers, and that the average life expectancy of the autistic person is just 36 years. As the hugs end, the car doors close, and the engine starts, my wife and our children drive away. I'm alone now, trying not to remember that other leaving, the one that would change everything, the one that would set me on a path toward answers I didn't know existed. November 2014. I'm sitting on the edge of the bed in a dimly lit second floor hotel room on Sanibel Island, Florida. I'm here for a writer's conference. I've mostly come to meet Richard Russo, Pulitzer Prize winner and hero to literary-minded upstate New Yorkers like me. Russo grew up just a few exits down the throughway from mine. His first novel even bears the name of my hometown, Mohawk. Mohawk is Beth's hometown too. Her parents still live there in the same house on Church Street where she grew up the house where she and our two kids are staying right now, have been staying since she left our home, left Indiana, left me. We had a fight on our way to the Indianapolis airport. I experienced what I would later call an autistic meltdown. But at the time, neither of us knew what had happened or why. Both of us were devastated. But because I was the one channeling the demons, I would need to accept the blame. I would need to be left. You have heard it said that anger is fear's bodyguard. But I say that anger is fear's body double. It's evil twin. They dress in each other's clothes. 
No one can distinguish between them. Penetrate the veneer to understand the primal reactions below the surface. No one knows there is a veneer. At its best or worst, the ruse is complete, the power absolute. If I'm talking in abstractions, it's for at least two reasons. One, I still don't understand the outright terror that exists for me in autistic meltdowns. I don't really know how to talk about them, and I'm a little scared to, as though I might somehow afford them even more influence. I know that's absurd, but meltdowns have threatened to undo me. In them, I believe I've seen hell. Two, the nature of meltdowns is as close to an out-of-body experience as I've had. I honestly don't remember the details after. They seem to be a last resort regulatory mechanism, a shocking reset button for the nerve endings. When I come to, I'm prickly, rumpled, dazed. Autistic writer Ashley McKay describes her meltdowns as emotional avalanches saying they can happen at any time and be caused by a number of factors, including environmental stimuli, stress, uncertainty, rapid and impactful change, and more. She talks of her heart pounding, throat drying up, tears falling, senses blasting, the room spinning. Suffice it to say these are punishing events and we don't have control over them. But again, how could anyone expect to know what's happening when you don't know you're autistic? Back to thinking you're a horrible person, a loose cannon, back to depression, back to suicidal ideation, which brings us back to the dimly lit hotel room on Sanibel Island. It's the worst day of my life. I'm positive that I cannot live without Beth and our two beautiful children. The only thing on my mind is quitting this life. I plan to get up from the hotel bed walk across the patio past the perky orange lounge chairs with drink holders to the water's edge and enter the Gulf of Mexico until the salt water fills my lungs and claims me. I don't want to write this down, not now, not ever. This is not a story I want to tell myself or anyone else, but I need to tell the truth. So if someday my kids read this account, I'll trust them to feel their feelings and come to terms with these realities to mourn my past and their past as I have. It's awful and there's no way around it but through it. I want to walk into the water, but my body's frozen to the bed. I sit motionless for well over an hour. I move only to turn off the light and lie down. When I sleep, I do not dream. Why wouldn't my body move toward the sea that night? I'd rehearsed the act in my mind. Nothing would have stopped me from carrying it out. I knew not a soul on the entire island. I was a perfect stranger to everyone at the conference and at the hotel. It was dark out and the beach was nearly empty. It would have been easy. My body wouldn't cooperate. Something stopped it from happening. Was it merely the inexorable pull of doing stuff? Setting an alarm, getting up in the morning, dutifully attending sessions at the conference, eating, brushing my teeth? Was it just my autistic need for structure, routine, control? Did I make a choice, conscious or otherwise, to live? Did God save me? I don't know. But I lived. A few days later, I came home. And a few weeks later, Beth and the kids came home. Though there would be much work ahead of us, it was the best day of my life. Okay, at that point, I, I springboard into um, the diagnostic journey. Uh, and so I'm going to skip over some of that material. It, you know, as I mentioned, um, in times of crisis, you start searching for answers. And so I began to read a lot of books and be online and try to figure out what's going on with my brain. Why is it different? Am I depressed? Am I... Uh, I don't know. And I didn't have any answers until I began reading about autism. Uh, sometimes it's in, in many cases in, in books that were more than say 10 years old, it was called Asperger's syndrome, of course, but that has been uh, changed. Um, in 2013, the DSM 
uh, the new version of the DSM that came out in 2013 folded Asperger's syndrome into the autism spectrum. So now we just say autism. Uh, I, I'm going to read one very, very short section with a couple of quotes from uh, a book that I read, uh, just to give you the sense of how I was so confused early on and I didn't understand what was happening to me. And then when I began to read about it, everything fit like a glove and I had affirmation and validation and I knew I didn't have to carry around this shame, but yet I, um, I, I just needed better understanding. So I go on to talk about all the books I began reading after I recognized myself in the symptoms of autism. In his book, The Journal of Best Practices, a memoir of marriage, Asperger's syndrome, and one man's quest to be a better husband, David Finch describes the time when his wife, who happened to be an autism expert, decided to confirm her suspicions about him. She sat him down to ask a series of questions that might begin a journey toward a better place. I connected with his astonishment at the profound acumen into his life that the questions offered. I'm just going to read a couple of quotes from this book. When I discovered this book, I connected so clearly with it. And so this is quoted from the book uh, from David Finch. This is his wife speaking. She says, do you tend to get so absorbed by your special interests that you forget or ignore everything else? Special interests, David says. You know, she says, things like practicing your saxophone for four or five hours a day, or when you wrote scenes at the Second City and I hardly ever saw you. Oh, well, sure, I said. I, I mean, doesn't everybody get into stuff? No, she replied. Many people can do something they enjoy and not let it consume their whole life so they forget to pay bills or put on shoes or check on their family once in a while. Later in the same scene, David becomes even more dazzled by how on the nose the questions are. And this is his wife speaking again. Before doing something or going somewhere, do you need to have a picture in your mind of what's going to happen so you can prepare yourself mentally first? This question seems rather insightful, David thought. Oh my God, I stammered. Yeah, that's totally me. Do you prefer to wear the same clothes and eat the same food every day? Do you become intensely frustrated if an activity that's important to you gets interrupted? Do you have strong attachments to certain favorite objects? Those are all yes, David replies. I know. Do you have certain routines which you need to follow? Do you get frustrated if you can't sit in your favorite seat? I have literally ended friendships over the seat thing, David said. <laughs> Do you feel tortured by clothing tags or clothes that are too tight or made from the wrong material? Do you tend to shut down or have a meltdown when stressed out or overwhelmed? All yes, David thought, but he was too stunned to answer aloud. Um, so I just wanted to share those two sections from early in the book to kind of give that contrast between what it feels like when the autistic brain is doing its thing, but you don't know what it's doing or why or how versus when you begin to learn um, and take that journey toward education and wisdom and awareness. Um, and it, it can, can, can kind of relieve some of the shame and guilt uh, that you carry around for not knowing why your brain works differently. And that's really the heart of this book. And that's uh, a lot of what I talk about throughout the rest of the book. So I, ho I hope uh, some of you all get a chance to read it if you're interested. Um, so I'll hand back over to um, Tammy. Is it right that um, we're going to go to breakout sessions? That's right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for, for sharing your story and for opening for us a picture of, of life for you and for many that we know or maybe are yet to discover. Yeah. Um, as we now uh, enter our time of breakout rooms, you'll hopefully be joined by an ELCA coach that will be meeting you in that room to help facilitate the conversation. Um, we have uh, a couple questions that Daniel has given to us and they will, um, I think David is going to uh, help the help to um, make sure that they come to you in your breakout rooms, but I, just uh, to give you a sense of what the invitation is for your conversation. 
to, um, to together to, as a group, share your experiences, your feelings, or associations that come to mind when you hear the word autistic. And after you've all had the opportunity to share, what kind of trends or patterns stand out for you? And a second question, what do you think might or could or should be the role of the body of Christ in the struggle for justice for people with disabilities or neurobiological differences of many kinds? Okay, so got a couple questions for us to, uh, to have in our conversation and we will uh, come back at 10 to the hour to share any kind of insights, learnings, and awarenesses that came in the conversation. So God bless your discussion. Uh, when we come back, there's going to be a book giveaway. And, uh, and also, um, so we look forward to that. So blessings on your conversation. This is really helpful for me as I have a grandson who has autism. Um, the spectrum piece, um, Low functioning versus high functioning. What is there something about that to for me to learn as to how it impacts the, sim the symptoms or the experience? Okay, I'm back. Can you see me okay. now? Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> My yeah. screen froze up for a second. Sorry. Um. Yeah. I would. I would oh, just say. So then they could could. Could you hear my question? Yes. Yeah, I caught okay. that and then it froze okay. up right after that. So okay. I would say this, most of the time what autistics talk about with high or low functioning is that those are so fluid that like if you read, you know, when you hear me read that scene, I mean, here I'm 35, 36 years old and, mm -hmm. and uh, driving to the airport to take a trip and I'm acting uh, like a, a, almost a child, you know, so, um, so in the midst of a high functioning life, so to speak, where I have um, multiple advanced degrees and I'm a university professor and everything else, mm -hmm. I can have a meltdown that puts me in a very low functioning place for a minute uh, mm -hmm. or longer, uh, a couple days, a couple hours, a couple weeks, whatever. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times what we end up saying is uh, we get rid of those two terms and instead we say um, um, people who have, who have higher support needs um, cause there are, there are autistics who have constant support needs, perhaps they're nonverbal. Uh, they, they have, you know, lots of physical and, and, uh, neurobiological challenges. And then there are, there are autistics who are verbal and, and, um, so-called high functioning, but we, we mostly just say like me, and we mostly say we have lower support needs. I don't mm. generally need a ton of support to function every single day. Uh, but sometimes I do. So <laughs> it's very mm -hmm. fluid. And so it's kind of a tricky thing. But yeah, does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I hate to be a downer on the, the reading, but I, I like to start with that piece because, you know, some kids, kids today sometimes can have better access to a diagnosis because we're so much more aware in the medical and uh, mental health communities and people my age and older are getting diagnosed in their 30s, 40s, and and 50s even, and and uh, we never knew what was wrong with us all these years. And so, uh, when it comes into place, it's quite a it's quite a relief. Mm -hmm. So, it's usually a good sign that people are slow to return from the breakout groups. It means <laughs> that they were having good conversations. Yeah, and I, I tried to design the questions so that it would. Um, be asking folks to tell their own stories if they know if they have a family member or friend who's autistic or whatever um, to be able to explore that. So I'm hoping that people had a meaningful time. Well, welcome back. I'm going to hand the baton over to my colleague, David, who is going to introduce this next little section.
So our speaker has graciously agreed to allow us to uh, give away two uh, copies of his memoir. And your names are all on this handy wheel of names. <laughs> so I'm going to spin the wheel. And if your name is selected, we'll just ask you to drop your mailing address in the chat so we can send that book your way. Here we go. All right, Raymond, congratulations. And winner number two will be... Leonard. All right, so Raymond and Leonard, I'd invite you to drop your mailing address in the chat and we can send those books out to you. Congratulations. Isn't that fun what technology can do? All right, wonderful. Well, I uh, want to welcome you back from your discussions, your small group conversations, breakout time. And I'm wondering um, if you would share, keeping confidences of the small group, a bit about what happened in your time together. Janice, and we had a, a really good, but brief conversation. Um, but I think a few of the takeaways um, that are really important for us to hear is that really becoming more knowledgeable of particular people who might fall on the spectrum to become more knowledgeable about the autism spectrum overall is really helpful um, and that it helps us to maybe think about ways to be using God's creativity uh, to create an environment where others are welcome and to realize that many times the church really just loves people who are just like us, you know, or who are just in that way. And so to find a way to make um, the church more welcoming of maybe kids who have different behaviors than the norm, um, but also realizing that these kids a lot of times take hits to their self-esteem. And so how do we help them know that they are God's children and that they are loved as they are and that, you know, there's joy in that. And then to realize that we all need grace because we're going to step in it and fall in it and not do what we should do sometimes. So I'm um, realizing that this was a really helpful, useful day. And, and Daniel, just also, we are in awe of your writing skills and the ability to make us who maybe don't fall on the spectrum to really understand more what that's like. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Janice. I think there were two other rooms. If we could hear from each of the rooms, that would be fabulous. Well, if my group is okay with me talking, because I was taking notes, um, I will do that. Um, we had in our group um, a, a, a variety. That's for me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What? I, I'm okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, we had a variety of experience um, with um, autism. So some uh, who just know people who are high functioning and doing their jobs. And some like me who have a nonverbal autistic grandchild who it's very difficult to find what he wants. So, um, but if after talking about that, then we talking, talked about ways of it, you know, what the church should do. And, and as we, we can echo what Janice said is finding ways of inclusion. Um, we have autistic adults in our congregations who are in, uh, you know, functioning members who do things. They're part of, they have some leadership skills and that's so, so making sure we, we include them. 
but also for those who um, it was identified as how do we support people who um, do need uh, a, assistance with their um, their children or their their lives and that so um, I'm not sure we came up with an answer we just know that we needed to do it and that they are loved yeah. thanks Jill oh one more thing you need to stop shaming people's behavior so recognizing that that's that you, as you, Danny, you said, sometimes you don't know where it came from. It just happened. So we need to stop shaming that behavior. So. Yeah, thank you for that. That's a huge point. And, and whether it's children or adults, um, we, our brain, our, the operating system of our brains is just different. And so it, it is about understanding and, and gaining wisdom, I think, to a large extent. Um, I didn't take any notes, but in our group, we we did have uh, everything from those who have grandchildren, uh, who uh, um, one verbal, one not not so verbal, um, and to uh, all the way to having adults in the congregation who we recognize as being on the spectrum. And we talked a great deal about the ways in which some congregations are able to uh, include those children in, in functional roles where the children really feel and the teens and even and, and really feel they belong, uh, that they're part of that community and that they belong because of the responsibilities they're allowed to partake of. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Well, thank you to each one of you for your conversations together, for creating the safe place and the great place for this to continue to be explored in and for us to grow in our understanding of what it means for us to be community uh, embracing uh, neurodiversity. Thank you, Daniel, for sharing with us uh, your writing. Thank you for your generosity of sharing the gift of uh, for the drawing. Congratulations to Leonard and who else? Leonard and Raymond for hey. your for your uh, opportunity to have uh, have some new reading material um, and to open and hopefully to share with your faith community as well. Daniel, so, I look forward to reading and growing from you. Thank your you book. so much. Thank you. It's nice to meet you. So thank you again for being here with us today for bringing your truth, encouragement, and hope that we share in the promises of God. So next week, we hope that you'll join us again uh, on June 29th as we continue to grow in our witness as community. So as we leave our uh, time together, I would like to share with you a blessing. May the healing love and grace of God be in every corner of your heart, crevice of your mind, and cell of your body. May peace abide within, around, and through you. Amen. Mm -hmm. Blessings. Thank you all for being here. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Bye-bye.